Our sermon text is the Gospel Lesson for Sexagesima Sunday. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The reception of the Word and the creation of faith is purely passive on man's part. God's Word comes to us, whether we choose it or not, and if it produces faith in us, it does so without our will and plan. Even as a seed contains everything necessary for the growth of the plant, so the Word of God contains everything necessary for faith. All that we do is passively receive the Word by not resisting it. Last week was Septuagesima Sunday, marking the 70th day from Easter. Today is Sexagesima Sunday, marking the 60th day. We observed last week how the Gesima Sundays had been used in the 4th century to prepare converts for formal instruction and reception in the faith. The Gospel text had been the parable of the landowner who goes out from sunrise to sunset, calling laborers for his vineyard. He pays them all the same wage, whether they worked one hour or twelve. Thus, the call to repent and believe in the Christ is universal, and the convert is joyfully invited by the promise that salvation is free to all. But lest the convert become proud for having, as he thinks, chosen to believe the truth, today's text was added, which teaches that faith is planted by the Christ and caused to grow by the Holy Spirit. Everything which concerns our salvation from beginning to end is the gracious gift of God. We properly give God thanks and praise for this, because if he did not win, give, and maintain our salvation by himself without any help from us, we would not be saved, for man is not capable of any good toward God. This knowledge should also humble us, for we have no right to boast about anything that we have, neither life, nor salvation, nor wisdom, not even the orthodoxy of our Lutheran fellowship. All is the gift and working of the Holy Spirit, who plants the word of God in us and causes it to grow and bear fruit. Along the same lines, St. Paul's message in our epistle lesson is summarized in these words, Do not boast. He begins with the false teachers among the Jews, and says they have no right to boast in being Hebrews, for even he is a Hebrew. They have no right to boast in their labors, for he labored to the point of lashes, stoning, and shipwreck. And yet, concludes Paul, even I should not boast in my works or faithfulness, for God has said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now the ultimate weakness of man is sin, and the ultimate strength of God is forgiveness. Therefore, the strength of God is in saving the worst of sinners, purely by grace, by planting in them faith to trust in the atoning sacrifice of the Christ. To use the language of today's parable, man is but dirt. Now, dirt is completely passive. It cannot decide whether it wants the seed or not. It cannot help in getting the seed. Dirt can only lie there, doing nothing, until the seed comes and makes something useful out of it. In the same way, the heart of man is naturally dead in sin and unbelief, so that he cannot desire God or find God. But when God comes to man in his word, he makes man into something good, holy, and pleasing, so long as the word is taking root, growing, and bearing fruit in him. 
but not all the dirt is ready for the seed. Some is contaminated with rocks or thorns or is hardened on the road. These obstacles hinder the seed so that it does not bear fruit. From this, we learn that although it is not in man's power to help the Holy Spirit, it is in man's power to resist and frustrate him. Now this concerns the free will of man. Man, according to creation, is greater than the animals because man alone is able to choose right from wrong. This also marked him as having been made in the image of God. When man sinned, he died spiritually, and therefore lost the ability to choose and work what is good. In this way, man still has a free will, because it is part of his creation, and if he did not possess a free will, he would not be human. But because of sin, Man's free will is fallen, corrupted, and broken, so that in spiritual matters he cannot choose or perform anything good, although he is able, in a limited capacity, to choose and do civil good, which belong only to this earthly life. On this matter, the formula of Concord says the following, Before man is enlightened, converted, regenerated, renewed, and led by the Holy Ghost, he can, of himself and of his own natural powers, begin, work, or cooperate so as to anything in spiritual things, and in his own conversion or regeneration, as little as a stone, or a block, or clay. Thus far the formula. When the Holy Spirit regenerates a man through faith, he also regenerates man's free will. The Christian is again able, in a small way, to choose the spiritual good and do it, but only because the Holy Spirit is breathing life into the Christian's once dead soul. But then also, the Christian's free will remains weak as long as he lives. The formula of Concord continues. The reason and free will have the power, to a certain extent, to live an outwardly decent life. But to be born anew, and to obtain inwardly another heart, sense, and disposition, this only the Holy Ghost affects. He opens the understanding and heart to understand the scriptures, and to give heed to the word, as it is written in Luke 24.45. Then he opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. All this is to say, once again, that salvation, from beginning to end, is the work of God. Even our faith is not our doing, but that of the Holy Spirit. For the word of God is planted in us, either through the spoken or written word, and the Holy Spirit causes it to grow and produce the fruits of faith. When it comes to salvation, man cannot choose God or seek him except by the Holy Spirit's work. But man can resist the Holy Spirit and hinder his work. Thus we come to the rocks and thorns. If a man would but passively receive the word of God, all would be well. But man, on account of sin, puts things in the Holy Spirit's way. Those whose hearts are like the wayside are hardened against the Holy Spirit. They have given themselves over to the devil and his lies, so that they do not receive the word of God. These are the heretics and the unrepentant. Those whose hearts are like the rocky soil are merely shallow. They do receive the word, and it produces in them a real faith. But their faith has no depth, and when hardships or persecutions arise, they quickly abandon it. Such are those who give in to social or political pressure at the expense of their doctrine. 
In the ancient church, these were called the lapsed. Christian men and women who were baptized, but gave in to Roman persecution and sacrificed to Caesar in exchange for their lives and freedom. The lapsed were a contentious topic in the early church, whether they could be forgiven for their unfaithfulness and whether they should be rebaptized. The church councils reaffirmed the biblical doctrine that the lapsed were to be forgiven and welcomed back into the church as soon as they repented, but that baptism should not be performed a second time since the first baptism remains valid. Those whose hearts are like the thorny soil have surrounded themselves with worldly cares which prevent the exercise of their faith. Thus, Scripture contains special warnings against wealth. Not that wealth is wicked in itself, but wealth is often a distraction from true trust in God. According to St. Paul, marriage is also such a distraction. Again, it is not that marriage is evil, quite the contrary, but scripture warns that spouses will have difficulty practicing their faith because of worldly cares. Now these things become thorns when they get in the way of the Holy Spirit and prevent the exercise of faith so that the wealthy and the married Christians must pray all the harder that what they have might be useful to the Holy Spirit and not hinder him. Concerning all these, the formula of Concord teaches that in this respect, it might well be said that man is not a stone or block, for a stone or block does not resist that which moves it. Man is, in this respect, much worse than a stone and block, for he resists the word and will of God, until God awakens him from the death of sin, enlightens, and renews him. Here the formula of Concord is specifically speaking of the unbelieving, who in their unrepentant state do resist the gospel. This is not the case with true believers, who, through baptism and faith, have put to death their sinful nature, although the curse of sin still clings to them until death. Yet, whenever they sin, and whenever they frustrate the Holy Spirit, they repent and are renewed through the means of grace. Now, in order for seeds to grow and bear fruit, it requires good soil. The seed cannot grow on the wayside unless the hard soil is first broken up. Likewise, the rocks must be dug up and the thorns uprooted before the seed will bear fruit. In the same way, it is the work of the law to kill and tear out everything which hinders the Holy Spirit's work. It does this by revealing sin for what it is and showing us that we are dead and useless unless God plant his word in us. When man thus sees his sin and repents of it, then his heart is ready to receive the word of the gospel, which promises the forgiveness of sins for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every part of our salvation, from beginning to end, is the gracious work of God. We are not able to choose, work, or cooperate in any good thing, unless the Holy Spirit first come and renew us in the gospel. For it is the Father who made us in his image, before the fall. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who, after the fall, paid for the sins of mankind and lived the perfect life for our sake. It is the Holy Spirit who plants the word of God in us and causes it to grow into faith, so that trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, we are saved. All of this 
is the work of God. So that, as it is written in Ephesians, By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.